There are many diets purported to treat multiple sclerosis, but frankly the scientific evidence has always been kind of weak. We're forced to rely on anecdotes or at best epidemiologic or observational evidence. But today I present the first ever published randomized controlled trial comparing two diets to treat multiple sclerosis. The Swank diet, a low saturated fat diet, and the Walls diet, a modified paleo diet. Let's take a look at the publication and this will be followed by next week an interview with the first author of this publication, Dr. Terry Walls herself. Let's have some fun. To summarize the trial, this was a 36-week randomized single-blind trial. Single-blind because you can't blind people to the food they're eating. It was done at the University of Iowa Prevention Intervention Center, and there were 87 original participants, although only 77 completed 12 weeks of the diet portion of the study, and 72 got all the way to the end, completing the full 24 weeks. It was one-to-one -one randomization, which meant that half got the Swank diet and half got the Walls diet. I should note that Dr. Terry Walls recommends things other than diet, including avoiding certain toxins, functional electrical stimulation, and nutritional supplements. If you want to hear a summary of her book, you can take a look in the card above. They did a 12-week run-in to study patients at their baseline, and then a 24-week diet intervention. I should also note that both Dr. Roy Swank and Dr. Terry Walls believe that the diet really takes several years to have maximal effect. So 24 weeks is a short period of time, but of course, it's difficult to keep people in a randomized diet diet study for long periods of time. The primary outcome of the study was fatigue, but they did study walking and other things as well. And of course, when I posted this on Twitter, people complained that it's biased because the first author is Dr. Terry Walls, but who else exactly will do this research? And it's not like she was doing the assessments herself. She actually had blinded assessors assessing the functional outcomes. And if you want to take a look at the full publication, you can take a look at the links below. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications, and if you enjoy the video, please click like. This study included people with relapsing remitting MS aged 18 to 70, and because they were trying to improve fatigue, you had to have moderate to severe fatigue and score more than or equal to 4 on the fatigue severity scale, which is pretty significant, and because they measured walking, you had to be able to walk at least 25 feet, though you could use an assistive device. They excluded people who had a relapse or change in their disease-modifying therapy within the last 12 weeks because that could confound the results as people are improving from recent relapses and because people often lose weight on these diets they wanted you to have a body mass index at least 19 and they also excluded people with severe cognitive impairment because that could make it more difficult to comply with the diet. So let's quickly review the two diets being studied. The man to the right is Dr. Roy Swank who in the late 1940s found that there was an epidemiologic association between dairy and saturated fat consumption and the risk of multiple sclerosis. And if you want more information, you can click the card above for a full summary of the Swank diet and his research. So he advised a low saturated fat diet where you would avoid milk, butter, cheese, and meat. And you would limit saturated fat intake to 15 grams or 3 teaspoons daily, which is a very limited amount. You could, however, eat white meat of chicken and turkey with the skin removed and fish, but you would limit fatty fish such as tuna, salmon, trout, and sardines. You would also minimize dairy fat but you could eat non-fat milk, skim milk, low-fat cottage cheese, and 99% fat-free cheeses. You would also increase polyunsaturated oils to a minimum of 20 grams a day, although so this was thought to be less important than avoiding saturated fat. You would also avoid processed foods, hydrogenated oils, and limit refined sugar, and you would also limit salt, replacing this with seasoning and herbs, and you would take in one teaspoon of cod liver oil per day. Now, in her book, The Walls Protocol, Dr. Dr. Walls actually talks about three different diets, and the one in this study is actually the least strict version, the Walls diet. If you want to learn more about the three diets and the details, go ahead and click the card above. But in this diet, you would eat 6 to 12 servings of fruits and vegetables a day and 6 to 12 ounces of meat, depending on your gender, and you would avoid potential allergens such as grains, legumes, eggs, and dairy, with the exception of butter or ghee, which have the proteins removed, and you would also avoid nightshade 
shade vegetables. This is a highly simplified version of the diet. And as I mentioned before, other aspects of the WALS protocol were not done in this particular study. Now, to make things completely fair, both the Swank and WALS group were given the exact same nutritional supplements, one teaspoon of cod liver oil, 1,000 micrograms of methyl B12, 1,000 micrograms of methylfolate, a multivitamin without iron, because iron potentially could contribute to neurotoxicity in some neurological diseases, and 5,000 international units of vitamin D3, which could be adjusted to a target range of 40 to 80 nanograms per milliliter. Now, with diets, it's always a challenge to stick to the diet, and they did study adherence. So after 12 weeks, the people randomized to the Swank diet, 86.8% were considered adherent versus 79.5% getting the Walls diet. And at 24 weeks, the end of the study, 81.1% were adherent to the Swank diet versus 74.3% with the Walls group. And so it did seem that the Swank diet was maybe a little bit easier to follow. And I do think the Swank diet is less strict overall. And let's take a look at some of the characteristics of the people who went into this study. You can see the Swank diet group on the left and the Walls diet group on the right. And there were no statistically significant differences between the two groups at baseline, so the groups were fairly well matched. On average, they were about 46 years old, and it was overwhelmingly female, 92% in the Swank group and 82% in the Walls group. The people in the Swank diet group had MS for a little bit longer, an average disease duration of 12.1 versus 9.3 in the Walls group. And you can see the disease-modifying therapies they took. Some were on no medications, some were on oral medications, and some were on injectable medications but only a small number were on infusible, high-efficacy disease-modifying therapies. This was an overwhelmingly Caucasian study with around 95% plus being white, and it was a fairly well-educated group with most people having at least a college degree or even an advanced degree. And you can see their smoking status. Most were non-smokers, but there were a decent number of smokers, which is surprising for a lifestyle intervention study. So 14 in the Walls group, a little bit more than 6 in the Swank group. And you can see very few drank alcohol heavily above recommendations, which was only 3 in each group. They were overweight on average. So in the Swank group, the average BMI was 27.6. And on the Walls group, on average, they were actually slightly obese at baseline, 30.2. And then you can see the six-minute walk, the amount of meters they could walk in six minutes. It was 481 meters in the Swank group and 459 meters in the Walls group. A brisk walk over six minutes would be about 800 meters, so they were a little slow but not too bad. And only a small number used assistive devices such as a cane, five in the Swank group and four in the Walls group. And you can see their vitamin D was somewhat low in both groups. This is nanomoles per milliliter, per liter, excuse me, and if you convert to the U.S. unit, units of nanograms per milliliter, it would be around 20. So they did have low vitamin D, and their fatigue severity score was high, 5.3 in the Swank group and 5.2 in the Walls group. Next, we'll move to the results, and I'll show you in graphical form in a minute, but first let's look at the raw numbers. So we'll start with the Swank diet, and you can see their results at baseline in column two, and compare that to the end of the study after 24 weeks, and they looked at a lot of different things, but let's focus on a few categories. The first is the F SS fatigue severity scale, and they started off with significant fatigue, averaging 5.32 on the scale, and they dropped a full point to 4.32. Now, this is very significant, and it's pretty comparable to what is achieved with a lot of medications in clinical studies, such as Provigil. So diet can be just as effective as drugs in treating multiple sclerosis fatigue. They also looked at the six-minute walk test, again, how far you can walk in six minutes in meters, and they started off at 481 meters and improved very slightly to 491 meters. That's not a big difference, but at least they didn't get worse. Moving to the Walls diet, they did even better. Again, looking at the fatigue severity scale, they started off at 5.19 and they decreased more than a full point to 3.87, a very clinically significant difference. In the six-minute walk test, they improved slightly from 459 meters to 495 meters. Not a huge difference difference, but at least they got a little bit better. And finally, we'll compare the two diets on the different outcome measures. So first, 
we'll look at fatigue severity score relative to baseline. So baseline is at zero and all of the groups improved and we're looking at after 12 weeks comparing the Swank and Walls diet and after 24 weeks the same thing and you can see there was a trend towards people on the Walls diet improving by a little bit more but this was not statistically significant but all four groups improve relative to baseline. However if you look at the modified fatigue impact scale a different measure of fatigue and multiple sclerosis you can see by the end of the study the Walls group did seem to do a little bit better and it was statistically significant though not by an enormous amount. Now in terms of the quality of life scales the Walls group did definitively better both in mental and physical quality of life and by a statistically significant amount both at 12 weeks and 24 weeks. Now keep in mind these scales are very subjective but you can see the Walls group did do definitively better. This is mental quality of life and the next graph is physical quality of life. Finally, they looked at the six minute walk test. Again, how far you can walk in six minutes. Now, none of these groups were statistically significantly better than baseline. They did do a reanalysis where they removed the people who were non adherent to the diet at 12 weeks, and they said all of a sudden there was a statistically significant superiority in walking, both for the Swank group and the Walls group. But I don't really believe in that kind of secondary analysis because it can introduce certain biases. You can see there is a trend that at the end of the study, people on the Walls diet seemed to improve more, but in absolute terms, this was only about 30 meters over six minutes, not exactly life changing. So, this was a great study. I'm really glad to see it, and I hope that we get more research in a randomized trial format on diet and multiple sclerosis because I think overall the observational and epidemiologic evidence suggests that it is very important. It's just hard to give definitive recommendations without studies like this. And of course, I'd be interested to know your own experiences, whether you've tried the Walls diet or any of the diets recommended by Dr. Terry Walls or the Swank diet and your own experiences. Now my thoughts on the study overall, one thing I would say is it looks like diet is meaningful in MS. If you look at both groups, they did have clinically meaningful improvements in fatigue and that's a major, major symptom in MS. A lot of people with MS report that as their worst symptom even if they have other more conspicuous symptoms like weakness or vision loss that kind of thing fatigue can be very disabling so a one point drop or more than one point drop in the walls group is very very clinically meaningful and you could have the same experience that dr walls herself had where she could actually stop taking her stimulant medication because her fatigue was so much better i've seen that in real life i do believe it's possible now, the question is, is the Walls diet actually better? Well, overall, the Walls diet performed very well in the study, no doubt about it. There was a clear trend in multiple outcome measures where it seemed to be superior to the Swank diet, and I think it's reasonable for people to do it. Do I think it's definitively better than the Swank diet? I wouldn't say so. It seemed like the Swank diet was a little bit easier to comply with. That kind of favors the Swank diet. Maybe that would be more important in the long run to some people, that it's an easier diet to follow. Also, there could be a little bit of a bias in the study. Maybe people enter the study because they like Dr. Walls. They want to support her ideas. These surveys are very subjective, so it's a little bit difficult to say for sure that they weren't trying to make her group look good. They were more motivated to fill out the survey in a certain way. So I wouldn't say it was definitive, though it is suggestive that, of course, the Dr. Walls diet or the Walls diet specifically could be better than the Swank diet. Anyways, I hope you look forward to the interview of Dr. Walls herself. We'll talk about some of the technical details, some of her own experiences. And if you have any questions, please post in the comments below.